So good morning, everyone. Um, we're just uh, seeing the uh, attendees sort of filtering in to the webinar. So um, we're just going to give everyone another minute or two to uh, to join because uh, the, uh, the the numbers are still going up quite quite quickly. So please bear with us, and um, we'll be starting in a, in a minute or so. Whereabouts in the world are you today, Steve? Where's... Well, I don't know. I was, there was a few options, but I've decided to work from home. Um, I did. I well done. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Surprisingly. <laughs> a so wise move. Have you, have you got a good, <laughs> a good view out of your window? Uh, yeah. 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 Just uh, watching the dog chewing a bone in the back garden. Try and keep him out of the way and quiet whilst I talk to these lovely people. So. <laughs> Dog's not still attached to the, the uh, bone's still not attached to someone, is it, or something? Or, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Great. So I think I think we're um, we're a couple of minutes a couple of minutes in now, and it looks like we're um, we're still getting a couple couple of people coming in, but. Um, but uh, it's starting to starting to slow down. So I think um, I think it's a good point to to start. Um, so again, everyone, thank you very much for for giving up a, a bit of time to uh, to come on to our webinar today. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, chatbots and really speed and simplicity in in deployment of chatbots. Um, I suppose this webinar has come around as a foil, really, to some of the other. Uh, vendors, uh, webinars and, and events that I've seen, certainly over the last few weeks anyway, um, which are suggesting that, you know, there, there is a, a, you know, a massive program of, of sort of transformation with a huge team and, you know, a load of data scientists that, that's required to actually start, um, you know, implementing a, a chatbot or automated AI solution. And here at IPI and, and, and CX, we, we, we believe that's just simply not the case, um, that actually this can be done very efficiently, very rapidly, very quickly, and in a very, very short time frame to start delivering operational benefit and, and advantage. So um, for those of you who haven't um, joined us before, I'm Steve Murray. I'm Solutions Director at IPI, uh, and I'm joined by a couple of esteemed colleagues. Um, on the webinar, um, and I will let them introduce themselves now, Simon. Thanks, Steve, um, and thanks for uh, uh, letting me kind of join you today on this this webinar. Um, so I look after uh, CX company for the UK. Um, I've actually been in the industry uh, for for quite some years. Actually, I was um, just having a, a, a reflection on that, as we do at these times. And actually, next week marks my start of my twenty fifth uh, year. Uh, since I walked into the call centre at Southwest Water down in Exeter and started my career in the customer service industry whilst uh, still a student. Um, and I also realised that was probably the last time that I sported a pretty rubbish ginger beard as well. So uh, <laughs> there's some symmetry there. Brilliant. Thanks, Simon. And Rich? Yeah, I think there's some symmetry with uh, my beard <laughs> as well. It seems to be the, the COVID look, COVID-19 yeah. lockdown look. But uh, yeah, so I'm a senior consultant in the uh, applications area at IPI, and I've been at IPI for about five years now. I think it's near enough five years to the day, actually. Um, and what I'm going to do today is talk around the key pillars of implementation and also walk through uh, a demo with you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rich. And um, your, your five-year centenary cake is in the post. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, so guys, yeah, as, as we kick off, what, what we generally like to do, uh, as I'm sure for many of you who've, who've sort of joined us on, on these webinars before, is we generally like to have a look at what we see going on in the market at the moment. We like to use some primary research from different research groups and organisations to, to sort of get that, that view on, on what's happening in, in the market within the CX uh, industry, the contact centre industry itself. So um, notice the, 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 the subtle use of language within this, which was what was happening uh, in the market. So, um, 
So if we if we look back, um, it seems uh, about what, two years, but in reality, it's probably only a, a few short weeks. Um, we had a, a, a Nicola Millard, who's a, a futurologist uh, at BT. Uh, BT published a sort of futurology uh, paper uh, on a sort of annual basis. Uh, and some of the findings from that were, were quite interesting and quite stark, actually, uh, this time around. So 74% um, of respondents had actually phoned a contact center within the, within the last year. And, and that was a marked increase um, from, from the previous time they'd asked that question back in 2015. Um, and I suppose that tells us that, that actually um, people are still wanting to take that phone channel for that first contact resolution when things get difficult, awkward, and that actually those volumes are, are only increasing. And what's even more interesting, I think, and in such a short space of time, is that now 80% of respondents expect organisations to use AI and automated voice services to answer queries from, from customers. Uh, and that's jumped up significantly from 2017, where only 67% of people expected that. And we can attribute that to a number of different factors. The, the saturation now of, of AI within our devices, within our home, our smartphones, within our cars, we're, we're, now, we're now using AI and automation uh, you know, in a sort of all pervasive uh, manner. Um, within within our homes and, and actually the reality is contact centers you know are behind that curve so so actually the, the technology that consumers have, now have access to is in most cases very much ahead of what we can offer um, within within contact centers um, Simon I know you had a couple of points on this yeah so Steve we're not seeing the slides actually or maybe that's just me um, I oh, didn't okay. want to interrupt you no, but uh, perhaps just double check that um, yeah, I think that it's, it's always useful research. So thank you. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, just to kind of restate there what, what, what Steve was going through. I think there's two other um, interesting um, observations coming out of this. And uh, knowledge is really important um, in, in the chatbot world, as, as, as you'll all understand. And um, what's quite interesting here is that um, it, it, the disconnect between what the company has on the the website and what agents are actually aware of in terms of, of information um, and, and having a kind of disconnect in that knowledge. Um, it means that customers are often more in control of the conversation or more in control with the rate relationship with the business than, than, than perhaps the, the agents or the companies are. So I think that knowledge um, layer, that knowledge industry has become a real competitive kind of battleground for, 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 for us in the chatbot world. And, and I think the the second point on there around um, uh, when is it appropriate or right to deploy chatbots? You know, what what is the sort of consumer appetite, customer appetite for wanting to engage with them? And I think increasingly um, we we've sort of seen up until COVID that you know we start with getting the high volume, lower value transactions automated, moving them away from the front line. What COVID has done markedly, and we'll touch on some of this in a moment, is actually has meant that companies are starting to look at some of those um, higher volume, medium value um, contact types. So the likes of the refunds and the more complex tasks as, as needing, you know, out of a, a matter of urgency to sort of, uh, um, you know, automate them now. So I think the the, the business case for, for chatbots has largely been defined um, by, by what's happening with COVID, right? Um, and now it's more a case of, how do we start? Where do we start? And, and, and what are the options in the market? Mm. Yeah, thank you. So as, as we often do with our with our webinars to, to make sure you're all paying attention and, uh, and staying awake, um, we've, we've injected a few polls in. So I'm just going to launch the first of our polls now, which relates to that that slide. And this is this is actually um, from your view as a consumer. So actually, uh, as a consumer calling into contact centers yourselves, not necessarily as, this, as the CX professionals that, that you all are. Um, so I'm just going to launch that now and, and get your get your view uh, view on that. So um, it's really as a consumer, are you happy to use automation or AI to sort of complete um, to complete requests? Um, so we're just seeing the the answers starting to. Mm, it would have been interesting to have done this pre and post COVID, right? I wonder how that's changed people's. Uh... Oh, very true, very true. So we're just waiting for the last few responses to come in. 
before I close it. I'm going to close the poll now and share the results. So, yeah, I mean, overwhelmingly, we can see um, that everyone, 91% <laughs> of us uh, would be would be happy to use automation or AI. So, you know, for, for me, that's interesting, uh, you know, 11% higher than the, the, the BT Futurologist report. Um, you know, perhaps that uh, could be attributed to, to a, a more tech savvy audience, uh, an audience that understands the benefits of automation because of the environments that that obviously we're we're working in there, I think. So, um, yeah, in interesting stuff. That's great. That's a great result, isn't it? That's really interesting. Again, very different to what we would have seen, you know, even six months ago or even maybe even four weeks ago. Right. <laughs> so uh, I think that reinforces that. What, what do you think that would have been, Simon? What do you think the percentage rate would have been? Pre COVID, uh, pre pre COVID, um, I, I think I think we've seen um, the last sort of twelve months um, that a lot of the hype around automation and chatbots sort of were was prevalent, and I think there was not enough use cases out there for people to sort of really understand what it was doing and how it was doing it. So I, I would say, you know, really, it's almost changing month on month from our perspective. Uh, um, so I would. Um, I would go, you know, may, maybe as, you know, as low as kind of 30, 40 percent uh, would have would have felt comfortable specifically around chatbots maybe, you know, six months ago. But then I think we asked the same question, you know, two months ago. And, and I think we would have been into the, the sort of the high 50s and 60s, just as the, the, the use cases and confidence, you know, from our own use of them, as well as our consumers use became became there. So, um, you know, I think yeah, interesting. Mm. So, so just to sort of finish off on, on that kind of what was happening in the in the market piece, and actually I say was a lot of this is now even more more relevant than than before. I think um, some of the points that that we're sort of looking at, excuse my slide happiness there, um, it is really around that drive to, for for automation uh, of conversations and, and more than just frequently asked questions. So, I think sort of if you like V1 of, of chatbot and, and AI was really just sort of FAQs on steroids, if you like, making making those FAQs more dynamic, more intelligent. But I think very much more and more now we're seeing um, a larger drive to automation of, of perhaps what we perceive to be more complex things like quote to buy journeys uh, in insurance or, or proof of no claims, uh, bonus requests or, or rather um, uh, claim handling um, journeys uh, sort of being undertaken in, in insurance as well. So I think there's a uh, an uptake now of and, and a happiness to to try and sort of automate what what were perhaps perceived to be those those more complex journeys. Uh, Simon. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think what 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 comes with that complexity is is, is actually a complexity in the number of choices buyers have. I think in this space now, and I think um, it's just but for us as CX company, this is an industry we've been leading for over fifteen years. Yet it feels like it's a chatbot as a solution is only like weeks old, right? So. Um, we, do, we do about 5 million transactions a day, for example. So I think um, since more people have kind of got um, a clarity around the how, how to use the um, the chatbots effectively, um, you know, obviously there's more and more options in the market. But in truth, um, a lot of those do disappoint customers uh, and, and businesses because really they're just dynamic FAQs in disguise, right? And I think starting with that ability to handle and automate some of those FAQs is important and, and, and something which which, which is needed, but customers very quickly see through that it is just that dynamic FAQ engine and, and, and crave and expect more in terms of those automated journeys. So they want to be able to handle their contact end to end. They want to be able to apply for a, um, a refund or, or we do a Wismo in the case of retail, where's my order, et cetera. They want the, the level and depth of those solutions. So, um, you know, I think it's become increasingly important to be able to to, to, to have that capability. Um, otherwise, you almost undermine your own brand and your own you know, credentials in the market by professing to be digital when really it's just a repurposed FAQ, right? Um, so mm -hmm. there's, we'll show some examples of that in a minute. Yeah, very good stuff. So I suppose, as we were saying, that, that, that kind of what, what was happening, but uh, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but um, the last uh, last few weeks, last couple of months, in fact, have, have been a little bit different to normal. Um, there's there's been this wrecking ball uh, called COVID nineteen, which has swung in and and sort of smashed apart, um, you know, uh, 
our, our sort of BAU really. Um, so I suppose what we're seeing and, and the customers that, that we're working with is, is they tend to have sort of fallen into, into two camps really. And that's sort of Armageddon, uh, i.e. You know, some of our travel customers, our insurance customers whose contact volumes have just exploded. Um, demand is, is incredibly hard, um, you know, impossible to, to staff to, to deal with the, uh, you know, the number of number of inbound contacts and, uh, and inquiries they're getting. And then we've got some other customers, um, you know, retail being, being one, one example, where things have just dropped off a cliff, you know, and that, that demand's not there. Um, but those same challenges still apply in terms of staff absenteeism, sickness, getting that remote workforce up and ready, you know, having to deploy thousands of laptops to, to, to actually keep uh, any kind of sort of BAU going. Whereas perhaps before, you know, business continuity was seen as moving everyone into a, into a separate building because there'd been a fire flood or, or something like that. You know, very few were prepared to, to operate in this sort of, uh, in this sort of pandemic um, sort of type, uh, type world. Um, Simon, I don't know if you had anything to add on that. I think it's it, it's so such a range, so diverse in terms of what, what's going on here. And um, uh, you know, I was speaking to an outsourcer yesterday, um, who, apart from having bought forty kilometres of Ethernet cables to help people um, work from home, has also seen that his sickness um, has has dropped off um, because you know people are at home; they haven't got anything else to do, so they're actually not kind of ringing in fake sick, right? So um, they've seen that their productivity is actually, and their occupancy has actually gone higher in some instances. Um, with other, you know, we're, we're talking to other sort of clients who, who've um, just obviously just seen it drop off a cliff. We work with a number of health insurers, and there are no, um, um, you know, discretionary operations happening at the moment. So therefore, their their claims volumes have just gone, you know, completely um, off a cliff. But however the applications for health insurance, you know, and, and, and applying for health insurance has grown you know, massively as everyone panics and wants to get some treatment. So it's, I don't think it's a one size fits all, um, but I think one thing's for sure, the one constant here is, you know, we're all trying to work out how do we handle this and what's the best place to start and what role does automation have as a necessity in, in, in the way we manage customer demands going forward. Mm, yeah, so, so at that point, um, we thought we'd ask a, another poll of you um, which is really to see how have contacts uh, volumes been in your contact centre since COVID COVID nineteen. So I'm just going to launch that poll, um, and we've given sort of three options there: busier than ever, Armageddon, uh, virtually the same as before, or dropped significantly. So if uh, you'd all be so kind as to to give your your sort of feedback on on those answers. Um, and we can um, we can get a view on what's going on in the in the market based on the, the verticals that have joined the uh, joined the webinar today. Great. I'm just going to leave that open for another few seconds. Just still got some people polling there. Um, I wonder how many people will have started off with Armageddon and then seeing it changing as well. So we're seeing quite a lot of peaky sort of behaviours. So there's like, you know, short term travel industry, right? My flight's been cancelled. You know, that you sort that out and then you've no need to contact your airline again, right? So I guess there's lots of peaks and flows here, which were unprecedented. Yeah. Yeah. So so interestingly, it's it's actually a pretty even split between the three mm. scenarios. Um, but um, it'd be interesting to cross-reference these results with the with the vertical markets that that you're all working in, um, because we we're obviously seeing uh, seeing some some correlation between those different different sectors, different industries. But uh, I suppose what stands out for me actually is is that um, yeah, almost almost a third um, are still sort of seeing virtually the same as the same as before. So you know potentially signs that actually there's a as a chunk of BAU, which is which is now sort of coming out. Now we're uh, we're a few weeks few weeks into that. Uh, Steve, uh, I, I picked up on, on a survey by Steve Sullivan, Channel Doctors, right right before we joined the webinar actually, and and his um, insight kind of mirrors this. But the one thing he is saying is that um, some customers are saying, yeah, whilst our demands are relatively similar, it's when that demand is coming in. So it's coming in at different times um, in much more unpredictable patterns in terms of when that demand is happening. So I think people see a constant in terms of the volumes, but their kind of arrival patterns have just gone completely haywire. 
which presents mm. you know masses of issues with regards to forecasting and and, and and managing capacity and everything else which you know may, maybe some of our um the attendees here are seeing a similar sort of thing right yeah yeah it's uh, it's, it's an interesting interesting point so i suppose what we're quite lucky in uh, able to sort of share with you now is is actually some primary research that's been issued by our friends over at Gartner. Um, so obviously one of the one of the largest um, sort of research and, and consultancy organisations in the world. And and just a, a couple of weeks before this this webinar, they they uh, they launched their their latest report in March, which um, was really around the impact of, of COVID within the within the sort of tech tech sector. Um, so, so this is this is very interesting, very relevant, um, and I suppose it's it's showing that the um, that, that that really what we were seeing in our customer base, which was the the impact on on investment and and uh, and projects, really was was very much correlated to where the real pinch points were being seen. So around travel, retail, insurance, banking, it was a case of you know keeping the lights on. Let's just try and get through this get through this uh, this sort of mess as it stands um, whereas there were others that needed to be on the on the front foot so education public sector communications that needed to to proactively start getting uh, tech investment there to get messaging out there and, and deal with that contact demand and, and that that showed a sort of upward trend or upward correlation in, in terms of that uh, project and sort of tech investment as well um, Simon I know you had some some thoughts yeah. on this. I think what similar things really we're, we're sort of uh, many of those large scale five year multi year technology platform refresh uh, refresh projects have just had to pause right now. Um, uh, uh, interestingly, we are. I'm sure you're seeing this as well. We are seeing many customers using this as an opportunity to to migrate to cloud or start using more cloud based solutions, whereas perhaps they wouldn't have been doing so before. And I know you guys have been really busy supporting clients you know through that that shift as well and and, and everything else so um I, I think we've seen a lot of demand for um how can you help us get started now with this issue we have now and get it managed quickly so the technology has shifted from um you know large scale multi-year programs to tactical initiatives with a view to using covid as the minimum viable product you know the first uh, use case that we deliver um, and then we'll grow and evolve and, and, and into some of the other ones as well so it's not like they're just thinking COVID bots they're actually thinking let's start with COVID because it's urgent and then let's kind of then start to build out and expand expand that service which is interesting um, yeah. and I think companies are dealing with different types of contact that they just didn't have before I mean I, I saw, saw it yesterday but Admiral Insurance have said they're going to refund um, policyholders £25 because people are just not using their cars as much, thankfully, because of what we're being told to do, right? Um, but that in itself creates demand, that creates volumes, right? So they they now, you know, they've offered this, but what they don't want it to be is £35 cost of process in order to give a £25 refund, right? So it's a brilliant sentiment, it's the right thing to be doing, but they can't afford for that to undermine their sort of cost to serve. So automation then in that type of instance becomes a paramount, otherwise, That'll that'll just be a spiraling cost, and the sentiment then sort of overtakes. So I think it varies by industry. I think we've seen some real peaks at the start. It then dropped off, and then I think as we start to hopefully come out of this again, I think we'll see that 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 peak happening when people start wondering whether they can book holidays or um, you know restart some of the policies you know that they've had before. So this is this is going to be a constant that's going to be with us a while, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And 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 that that leads us really into to what what we're sort of calling this new normal. So in Gartner's, Gartner's world, the, the, they, they believe there were sort of four phases, um, which were, were sort of leading sort of back to BAU from a, from a disruptive crisis. So there's a sort of phase one, which is the sort of react and respond. And, and I suppose what we, we were seeing is this, this shift to the cloud, you know, BCP activity, getting remote workers set up, you know, we were doing a load of fast migrations for, for, for customers onto, onto sort of cloud, cloud cloud platforms to service those keeping the lights on getting getting contacts in and out routing to, to people who are now sat at home I think where we're from personal perspective and, and our customers where, where we're seeing a lot of our customers is probably at the the, the sort of in, in the trough of phase two I suppose which is this 
okay, we've got everyone set up, we've got everyone kind of working from home. Actually, how do we now optimize to start, you know, improving and enhancing what we're what we're doing here, you know, to, to get back to um, you know profitability and, uh, and 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 actually some some respectable SLAs in terms of how we're dealing with our with our customers. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm sure there's some people who, who see themselves, you know, in those in those later sort of phase three, phase four troughs. Um, and again, it will depend on on vertical market as well. So, um, so yeah, so it's sort of quite an interesting way of of looking at that, that sort of current state of play. Um, Simon, yeah, I think you're right. I think we're at the bottom of that trough in in phase two. Um, we've had to kind of first first step was just get people working at home. Now it's right. How do we automate this? You know, so I think we're we're at the stage where to, to kind of grow capacity and, and make sure we can handle the volume and still keep this sort of customer service going. Um, you know, we, we, we now need to be delivering um, um, chatbots and, and services, which is just going to help automate this. So we've got a, um, we're, we're ready, you know, we've been, we're, we're, we're helping customers, we're, we're building, you know, COVID bots, we're, 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 we're kind of, you know, delivering these services now. And, you know, we've just got to just keep that going really to, to kind of help where we can. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so on that on that note, well, we're going to have a quick poll again, um, looking for your your feedback. So, um, based on that that Gartner um, phasing, if you like, um, crisis phasing, I'd be interested to see where you guys, uh, where you guys as, as sort of CX and contact center professionals sort of see yourselves, um, you know, with within those phases, if it's that kind of react and respond, redirect. Or, you know, if you're already there, accelerating opportunities, you know, uh, you know, and you're, you're sort of ahead of the head of the curve, as it were. So, um, so we'll see those, see those votes coming in. So we'll just keep that open for a, for a few more seconds, just to give everyone an opportunity to uh, to take part in that. And I will close the poll in. A couple of seconds and uh, there we go okay so i'll share that so again interesting and yeah very much correlates with with what we've seen already from our customers which is which is that that sort of bulk of people you know are now are now in that sort of phase where they're they're looking at, at sort of you know how do we then optimize and, and make make this make this better for us you know now now we're in this kind of steady state scenario in in phase two but um i suppose more actually more than i thought you know 23 percent of people sat to the right of that in, in phase three and phase four and you know i guess personally i find that very encouraging um you know based on um based on you know where, where it could have been i suppose yeah com yeah completely right yeah great so What's what's very interesting, the final piece of, of sort of primary research we'll share with you before we start going into to a lot more focus on, on chatbot sort of build and, uh, and, and and sort of benefit is really the, the actions that um, organizations are, are taking. And again, this correlates in with this sort of phasing. So, you know, minimization of travel, you know, a, a new hire freeze, you know, cutting those operating costs, those are those are all the, the the sort of immediate band-aid type stuff that, that, that people have to do. But then we start to see things such as the increased use of automation and other advanced tools being extremely high on the Gartner's respondents agenda in terms of helping uh, deliver uh, efficiency change and, and revenue benefits, you know, off, off, the back of, uh, off the back of this current scenario. So again, Simon, I don't know if you had anything yeah, further to comment on that. I mean, I think, um, I think what's interesting here as well is um, the, the, there is not an appetite to want to reduce staff right now. And uh, I think historically, yeah. the sort of business case for, for automation and chatbots has been largely predicated on, um, you know, reducing o overall headcount. Actually, I think the the, 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 the clearest point here is, um, you know, the use of automation and chatbot to augment your um, your staff. Um, and, and grow capacity, I think, is, is, is really important. So, um, and I think at this time when perhaps your volumes have depleted, um, you know, every contact counts, right? And especially in a sales environment where every, you know, potential kind of customer coming to a site who's looking to buy a product or perhaps doesn't complete a transaction, um, we really need to be kind of helping them straight away to make sure that we, you know, we don't lose that opportunity because, you know, the 
the, the opportunities have just kind of depleted if you're in that sales world and we just have to maximize them. So, you know, bringing in a chatbot in that journey to offer help and assistance to complete transactions, I think becomes really important actually at this time, as well as just handling capacity and demand. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good, so I suppose a, a quick view on how we've helped our uh, customers during this process before we we get into um, rich and providing some demonstrations um, on 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 the simplification and build of a of a chatbot. So, I suppose for us, we we were sort of there at the front end, and, and we uh, have been looking at, at ways in in which we can effectively help people switch into that digital channel. So, we've been able to incorporate SMS, so proactive SMS. Um, so when customers are sat in queue, we can initiate uh, an SMS to them. And then they can then bring up the chatbot clients on their smartphone. So it just takes them out of that queue and they can start to, to handle those FAQs or, or more complex, uh, more complex journeys, you know, on that um, on, on that channel. Um, and again, that increased deflection to self-service channels has, has been a key part in, in you know, how we've helped some of our customers, you know, beat, beat those spikes, really. And I think we've, um, we've we, I think that's a great use case actually. That ability to to, to shift somebody out of a, an IVR channel and, and and into a kind of online journey using SMS, you know, is something we've done, um, you know, extensively across the board. You know, quite often with retailers, etc. And I think that um, you know, just getting that people out of the phone channel in the right way so that it's still a choice, I think, is is important. I think what we've also seen with a number of our existing customers actually, we've we've worked quite hard to help our, you know people we already work with of course and uh, they have um, they've really had to challenge you know some of the sort of golden nuggets around you know the things you would never automate right so uh, we had one um, uh, insurance client who would uh, would never give a refund um, unless it had been sanctioned by a, a conversation with an agent because they wanted to go through the, the steps of, of, of validating that that the refund was was due um, you know, they have now really questioned that and, uh, and have created a refund bot, um, which um, which really does allow them to get the same level of um, rigor in the kind of authentication process and validation of that the refund is due without actually spending more time um, and, and money on 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 a, on a customer who actually wants to leave, right? So so handling that is you know has been been really interesting and really good to get that set up. And then we had another. A uh, large telco who's doing hundreds and thousands of chatbot transactions a, a year already, um, and um, they were the victim actually of, of of a third party supplier changing an offer. So in this instance, they offered BT Sport as part of their packages to their customer base um, as part of their subscriptions. Uh, BT just said, you know, they're going to give a payment holiday because there's no sport going on at the moment. Suddenly, that meant they had a whole load of inbound contact from people wanting to get. Um, the payment holidays against that sports um, package. It wasn't of their, you know, volition. It wasn't their choice, you know, their choice, but they suddenly had to manage it at a time when they were least expecting it and least able to cope with it. So being able to guide a customer through how to apply for that refund, making sure that they're um, picking up on all the different ways in which customers are saying, I want the refund, or maybe I only want to postpone it for a month versus three months and all of that stuff, we've had to be able to handle within the bots to, to not only service that demand, but continue to improve on, on how that's being delivered as well. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's really interesting. Sorry, Son, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I know right? <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, if we look at um, the, sort of the demand we've had, I mean, you know, like, like you guys, we've, we've also had to, um, really, kind of increase the, um, the, the the volume of um, of support that we're offering our clients and potential clients. Um, really, you know, to, to the point of being able to increase capacity to to help service this unforecasted demand. And I think on the on the next slide is a good sort of representation. We've been, um, if we look at uh, the equivalent kind of digital agents that we've stood up um, during this COVID um, sort of crisis, we've actually uh, brought online the equivalent of um, 200 uh, agents a day every day for the last um, 14 days. Now we're um, uh, we, we we work across Europe, so actually some of our clients are you know Italian and and, and German and, and 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 French and and Dutch. So therefore they're slightly ahead of us, right? In in the UK in terms of that curve. So we've been supporting this demand for quite quite a while now. But um, for our customers, you know, it's proved invaluable to be able to. 
um, offer up the equivalent of the you know this additional pool of resource you know albeit as chatbots as virtual agents which without this they inevitably their their operations would have fallen over and we continue to build and grow on that and to to, to keep the lights on for many customers actually mm. yeah no it's uh, it's, it, it's it's impressive figures so I suppose for us then it's it's just about the, the to, to be clear around you know reasons why you know chatbot automation and AI now and, and why it's so so relevant so it, it's obviously ensuring that consistency of advice and service obviously you do find the the output uh, of that question so um, it's absolutely within your power and it's absolutely the right advice every single time that a, that a customer asks that question it's it's within your control so again from a compliance um, and, so, and the sort of ISO perspective you're, you're kind of delivering on that but also it delivers it immediately at, at sort of any time of day or night and again a recent uh, 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 piece of research that was done by Forrester shows that regardless of age group over 65 percent of people value first contact resolution above everything else so if that comes via an automated channel if we get the right answer that we want and we or, or at least the answer is, is is serviced first time then that's going to be uh, the most important thing for consumers importantly we're again we're talking about that scalability to meet spikes in demand as well this isn't about you know bringing in an extra x number of agents uh, to, to cope with that peak the chatbot can can natively handle that scalability to meet those spikes in, in demand and, the, and those increased in increased volumes. And ultimately there's that opportunity to reduce queue times and improve that first contact resolution as well. So again, with the example we've had where we're proactively SMS messaging people to take them out of the queue, again, Deloitte's latest research tells us that almost 80% of UK adults now have a smartphone. So let's let's serve up that information natively on the device that you know many people spend four five six plus hours a day on uh, it's a very familiar interface and people are willing to accept uh, automation and, and service through through that particular uh, ui so with that we've got a, a another poll question um and really it's a sort of open question guys to you, which is which is what is the reason your organization hasn't deployed sort of conversational AI up to this point? So I'm just gonna, gonna launch this. And there's a few different options on here to consider. Um, so um, if you could all have a look at them and, and sort of get voting. Um, first one really covers that sort of, you know, a perceived lack of return investment or, or perhaps evidence of the benefits that it's gonna, gonna give to you. Um, second one around lack of resource internally or, or perhaps internal understanding of, of you know how it can be done and 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 the, uh, and, uh, and operationalized 10 percent just a bit of a meh a lack of appetite sorry lack of appetite or, or understanding um, budget constraints um, or or other so um, a few a few to consider there so I sort of talk through them to give a, a little bit more time for people to sort of understand and assimilate those um those those questions um and we can see i'm getting we're getting a good uh, a good respondency right now so um i'll look to close this poll in a few seconds and we'll have a look at the uh we'll have a look at the answers okay right i will close that and share that so I suppose interestingly there that you know a, a bulk of, of the responses, a third of those responses sit around lack of resource or understanding, um, and and I suppose that that's that that definitely speaks to probably where where we have been in the in the UK market. Um, it's probably fair to say continental Europe has been ahead of us in terms of bringing in automation and AI um, as a, as a channel uh, and the, the the success that they've enjoyed over there. Uh, and the UK, we have been a little bit behind in terms of the the, the sort of understanding and, and being able to sort of pin those those benefits on really. Um, Simon, I don't know if you're yeah, yeah, I, I think on both um, sides there, you could probably comment on that. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. So I think uh, I think the ROI up to now has been um, muddied by lack of you know good quality use cases in the UK or um you know which have been emerging and you know i can share some sort of in a moment and and, and and often do and i think the second part is yeah i think that it's it's a it's often a myth that of the, the scale of effort that's needed to to, to get started with with, with the chatbot and i think um 
Um, our job is, you know, together with you in partnership with IPI and, and, and with others is, is to, to make this really easy actually. And the platform is, you know, very simple, very straightforward in terms of how to, um, how to build, you know, chatbots, but brings with it some, you know, really quite complex um, AI and machine learning capability, which is, you know, is what's needed here. So I think um, I can understand that, um, but I suspect that is as a consequence of others uh, in the market making it sound far more complex than it really needs to be, um, which is perhaps help people back a little bit here. But we'll, we'll, we'll show, we'll show sort of in the next few sort of slides how, you know, this kind of claim of we'll, we'll, we'll build a bot in three days is is real and can be done and which will take, you know, take take the audience through some examples. I think um, whilst I've got the floor, I'll sort of just chat through this slide here. I mean, um, virtual assistants, chatbots um, come in various different shapes and sizes. Uh, so I think it's quite important to almost just frame the conversation here around, you know, what it is we're, we're talking about. And there's you know, some examples on the screen. The um, the, the first two are, are, are from uh, insurers in, in the Netherlands. Um, actually, the ASR case, which I'll go through in a moment, is um, a really, you know, that's their front, front page, that's their landing page on their website, actually, and we're occupying pretty much all of the real estate there with, with, with uh, digital CX chatbot. Uh, Right-hand side is um, one of the pioneering projects that we did with yourselves at IPI and Rich in particular, um, with Northern Ireland Water, really interesting, you know, a water company in Northern Ireland, traditionally quite risk averse, you know, captive audience or captive customer base, um, but, but wanted to use something which was relatively innovative and of its time. This is, you know, two years old now as a, as a use case, you know, so to say that there's not the evidence in the UK is completely wrong. And, you know, when you look, it's just, you've got to know where to look sometimes, I think. So, and this is going great guns. Next stage for them is, you know, moving into some of the voice capabilities, you know, using, the same, um, the, the same kind of principles and, and, and underpinned by digital CX. So really, really some interesting stuff happening there. Then some of the more traditional or, or expected messenger type applications. So bottom left corner there, we're looking at in-app. Um, we're looking at, you know, within uh, Facebook Messenger um, where we're, we're supporting or able to support. We're in WhatsApp um, as well and, and, and other channels. So you're starting to see the, the more kind of conversational style of, of, of chatbot interface. Um, through to, um, you know, using the same platform. So Digital CX is configurable. So it not only applies to online in, you know, in-app uh, WhatsApp or a messenger, we also can start moving towards voice bots and uh, we're delivering Google Home type type um, skills using the same knowledge platform, which is actually where the market seems to be heading and, and should be going is, you know, you've almost got one knowledge base that serves all of the channels uh, hands over elegantly into each other, shares the data. It's where only channel really starts to become real, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Just, if I may carry on with the ASR example here. So uh, the leading Dutch insurer, as I said before, this is their front page. So the white elements are the sort of the um, uh, are us. You've got the tiles, the traditional tiles, and frankly, they know why customers are contacting them. You are going to them for one of for five things. You want to buy something or you want some support, you want some help or you want to update, get some service. So for them, structuring in this way is logical. Customers, you know, guided through the process really simply. They obviously had a lot of uh, travel insurance claims coming in around um, COVID, a completely new use case for them. Um, this was and it was manifesting itself as actually, you know, people are claiming for travel insurance for a number of reasons. And given this was, you know, European, they're several weeks ahead of us in terms of the lockdown and everything else. So um, being able to say, like, you know, not just saying, has your plans been disrupted? Um, it's actually what's the reason for that disruption? And then taking them down to that next layer of detail, very uh, personalized and very specific to the reason for that um, interruption meant that they could then actually guide the customer through to a complete resolution without the need to handing over um, um, to a, um, a call center agent if needed. If they did need to, of course, they could elegantly hand over, and pass the data across to the advisor, whether that be in web, web chat, live chat, or whether that be through voice, et cetera. But I think what this really illustrates is a very um, uh, quickly developed and delivered um, COVID sort of journey um it's kind of configurable and usable by anybody now right um but actually it takes what is a really complex issue um and makes it very simple as a, as a use case i think you'll agree that customer journey flow and that consideration around 
what the customers were wanting to, what they knew their customers were trying to achieve, is why they've managed to achieve such high levels of completion rate within within the self-service channel without the need to drop into an advisor, right? I really like that, what they do, and, and would encourage you to have a look at their website and, and, and see more of, of how they're handling things using using chatbots. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, innovative um, approach to, to sort of CX, but also the the UI as well on the website. I suppose when you when you when I, I think of an insurance company's website as a big picture of a family and a bloke holding a dog up or something like that on the front page. So to, exactly. to skin it to, to skin it down to the very bare essentials, which is we know why you're here. It's to talk about one of these things. Is um, it is 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 pretty radical, but actually makes makes yeah. a huge amount of sense when you. When and Steve, you, you make a good point there. Actually, I mean, clearly with ASR, they've invested quite a lot of sort of thinking in their UI. Um, you know, not all companies are going to have that luxury of being able to do that right now, right? So, um, Rich will show this in a moment, but you know, making available our default chatbot interface so that actually, with two lines of code, somebody can put a chatbot on their website now takes away yeah. that barrier from um, you know thinking well I haven't got the digital teams available to do all of that UX design don't worry about that right that this, we've made that really easy and, and many of our customers are leveraging that now because that was a blocker for them before right but, um, but Rich will show you very capably now I'm sure yeah absolutely so so yeah so on that note um, we're going to hand over now to to my my colleague Rich uh, Marsden so Rich is going to take you through the the demo show you how we build but also at first just talk you through IPI's delivery methodology so we, we've got a very well honed very very well structured five-step uh, delivery methodology that we've, we've created to allow the very rapid uh, deployment and operation operation I can't say it Easy view. yeah yeah, operation. Um, yeah. <clears throat> of, of, uh, of our chatbot solutions so Rich uh, on that note I'll, I'll hand over Thanks, to you Steve. Yeah, okay, so really it's just to echo uh, what Simon has um, started there by saying that, that it's important to, um, you know, the speed and simplicity of getting a chatbot uh, kicked off and started. Um, so IPI identified five key pillars uh, for, for successful automation. Uh, the implementation model is uh, a five-day plan, so we can see the five days here. Uh, number one, two, and three are to do with the build. Uh, and then four and five are the launch and the optimization. So the whole methodology is based on simplification of the process, speed and agility. So if we look at day one, this is a customer understanding. So IPI working uh, with you, the customer, to define um, and identify customer journeys, have a look at the success metrics and establish what they should be, and also look at who's going to be owning um, on the, the customer side, but then also who's going to be owning, owning uh, the delivery uh, on the IPI side as well. The second day is uh, the database build. Um, so IPI assess and orchestrate the content. Once we've got the content together, we have a look at it and we break it down into digestible customer journeys. Is it going to be a simple question and answer, which is generally about 400 words? Is it going to be a slightly bigger um, answer? So therefore we break it down into a dialogue, or is it going to be something called a what we call a, a conversational dialogue and a conversational dialogue is a full end-to-end -end customer journey so the chatbot is having a conversation with the customer um, discussing exactly what the customer is looking for and then going syncing with the crm system and then going and actioning um, the, the customer request so they're the three build stages and that's day one two and three uh, we then move to the launch and the enhanced stage which is the day four at four and five. Um, so we launch, we test, we add more content, and then what we're doing thereafter on day five is we're using the reporting dashboards uh, to establish um, how we can continuously improve. There's the human in the loop element because the chatbot learns from a blend of human and AI interaction. It's, it will always flag what it doesn't recognize, um, and then it's up to us um, to work closely with you. Um, and then make sure that the recognition rate is, is improved. Great. Thank you, Rich. So we'll move to our uh, first um, 
So the, uh, what I wanted to do here was just show you what the, the interface looks like. So this is a dialogue I've put together. It's about coronavirus and you can see the start node at the beginning, which, um, which is explaining, a, giving a summary, a simple summary. It then moves into what the conversational dialogue that I mentioned before. So how can I get a refund? So it's asking the customer for the email address, it's then asking for the uh, booking reference number. It's asking for the last four digits of the card number just to establish who that customer is and then process that refund. Now, I've very deliberately shown you the finished version at the beginning. But the reason being is I, I wanted to, to show you the power of the technology and how quickly and easily we can bring it to you. Um, it's a, a COVID-19 specific demo. It's about the airline industry. Um, but I think it's a really, really powerful slide um, at first. What I'm going to do hereafter is go into how that tech is put together. So the next slides are going to be how the tech is used, uh, the steps required to build it, um, and how IPI go about orchestrating the journeys. Um, and then beyond that, how we go about actually uh, evolving the chatbot so it continuously improves. So here is um, here, here's a demo on, on how um, chatbots actually put together. So first of all, we, we name the chatbot, so it's our COVID-19 chatbot. Uh, we then move into creating the dialogue flow and adding the dialogue content. So we've got our start node to begin with. We've then got our four uh, dialogue nodes that, that feed off that. The first is how can I change my ticket? Um, the second is how can I get a refund? Uh, third is uh, check if flight is cancelled. Uh, and the fourth is I haven't received my refund. Now, in all of these, um, the, the, the branches that lead to the dialogue node. So you can see here, how can I change uh, my ticket? How can I get a refund? This is absolutely replicated on the website. So this is what the customer would see. So it's important that the language and the branding is, is, uh, is how you want to, to come across as an organization. So Steve, you could just continue. We then name our dialogue nodes, and then we go about adding in the content for each of them. So on the change ticket, what we're doing is we're redirecting the customer to a cancellation page. And then on the refund, we're, we're inserting a T dialogue. So we're, we're actually gonna, I'm gonna go through the demonstration on, on how you build a conversational dialogue. And then what we will do is we'll slot that into the second node there, the refund node. If you notice that what's happening now is that on the I haven't received my refund, there's three dialogue subsections that come off that. So one is less than five days, the second is between five and 10, and, and the last one is, uh, is more than 10 days. Now, really, what we want to be doing if we receive something, if the customer hasn't received a refund in more than 10 days, we want to be escalating that. So the first two, the five less than five days and the five to 10 days, there's a response to the customer saying, okay, look, no, you might not have received the refund yet, but you should receive it in the next day or so. Um, whereas with um, for more than 10 days, you know, this is really, really pertinent to the, to the, um, the organization. We want to deal with this. Um, so what we're doing here is we're escalating to live chat. The chatbot has the ability to sync with, uh, with, um, with live chat. And, uh, and what this means is that a full conversation history can go across. So the conversation that the chatbot has had, the steps that it's got up to, are transferred to the agent. But beyond that, what we can do as well is we can actually uh, integrate with workforce management. So we can skills-based route accordingly to the most applicable agent, which is a really, really powerful tool to be able to use and, and, and something to do. So Stevie, just continue. Okay, the, so the way we add our addition, our live chat addition, is just by clicking on live chat and adding it to the text. We then save that, and then what, what we do next is we attach the dialogue that we've created to a Q&A set. This, so in this example, it's COVID. We search for our dialogue, we find our dialogue, create this Q&A, and then we, uh, we pin it. We then move to our patterns. So the patterns are instances or words that can be used um, 
if the question's asked in a hundred ways, it's never going to be asked in the same way. So what we want to what we want this, the uh, system to recognise is the variations on the way the question can be asked, and these patterns play that they play that role. So if there is a what you can see here, coronavirus, COVID, COVID nineteen, anything that relates to that is is going to receive that dialogue, which is a really powerful way of using the uh, the NLP and the machine learning. So Steve, you can continue. So we've built our pattern, we save our pattern, and then what we do is we move to transactional dialogues or conversational dialogues. So the get a refund dialogue node and the original dialogue was left empty, and that was for this. So here you can see there's a slot. So the first one is email address. You can see the outputs that are there. So the exclamation mark is the original question that's going to be asked. The X is, I don't understand the email address, it's not valid. And then the last one is uh, is thank you. And what you can see here is there's a validation script uh, and there's a, the email validation script. If it's not a recognized email, then it's the, the chatbot is automatically going to send the, uh, the, sorry, I don't recognize that email address. Please enter a valid email address. Whereas if it's um, within the, you know, if it is valid, then it, the, the chatbot's comfortable that it can continue. Um, there's also out of the box that there's a postal code and validation there's a phone number validation there's um a reg plate validation so these are all things that you know enhance the feature and, and ensure that the chatbot can continue on that journey the next couple of slots that have been filled out now one is the, the booking reference if you remember that was in the original um the original demonstration um, and then there was also the, the card numbers. And then the end is the, the text at the, big, at the end to say, right, okay, we've understood. Is there anything else that I can help you with? We then moved into the original dialogue, find that get a, a refund uh, conversational dialogue, set it as the default, remove the previous one, uh, and, then, and then that's completed. We then move to the next uh, slide, Steve. So here, so we've created our dialogue and our conversational dialogue. And so this puts a little bit more context around, um, around the, the example. So the, the questions asked about coronavirus, you get our start nodes at the beginning, we then get our four dialogue options that we created. How can I get a refund? So it starts walking, that triggers the conversational dialogue. So firstly, it's the email address, right, brilliant. We validated it, it's in the right format. We know that we can continue. Uh, it then goes to the booking number, get the booking number, like, brilliant, we know that that's valid, we can continue. We then um, get the four, last four digits of the card number, okay, we've managed to establish who the, uh, the customer is. Um, we make that refund, we confirm that refund, and then we say to the customer, is there anything else that we can uh, help with? In this case, there is. The customer has also had uh, a booking to go to Australia um, and wants to know whether that can still go ahead or not. So the chatbot responds saying, no, unfortunately, it isn't possible. And again, goes through the process of, of getting this booking. So it's taking the booking number, the email address. Um, do you want to change the flight date and time? Yes, brilliant, we do. Okay, when would you like to change it to? Can you please confirm that? Um, and then, so the, the chatbot's only had the conversation with the customer. It's taken on board what the customer's saying, and then is going to the CRM system at the back and making the required changes. You go to the next slide, Steve, it's about the dashboards. Okay, so what does this look, look like in the dashboards? Um, so the dashboards, it's important to regularly check the dashboards. When you build a, a new dialogue, we need to make sure that the recognition rate is, is good. Um, so recognition is the key metric, and this essentially tells you whether your questions have been answered or not. So in the example here, we've gone to the Q&A questions tab. We set the, um, the time period, we also um, put the, the questions that we want to see you know, whether they've been recognized or not. Uh, and then once we've done that, click OK, we scroll down and we can see what the recognition rate is. In this instance, the recognition rate is 100 percent. So we, we can be comfortable that the, um, the dialogue's created, the recognition is set up correctly and the patterns are working. There are going to be instances where it's not 100% or 0%. Um, 
in which case we look at that and we, we establish, right, okay, what is it that we need to do? Do we need to add our words into a pattern? Do we need to create a new question and add it to that Q&A set? The important thing to remember here is that the, the dashboards are very, very comprehensive. There's 12 comprehensive dashboards in there. And it's all about augmenting and optimizing um, and, and changing, changing quickly. You know, things that it doesn't recognize, it's important to, to react quickly. Everything is sent in real time. So you can continuously um, evolve the chatbot through using these dashboards. It's machine learning, it's natural language processing. So there's, that, that information is always readily available. And that's how you evolve your chatbot uh, and take it to the next level. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much, Rich. Well, I, I, um, I hope you, you all agree that, you know, uh, th this is something that can be done extremely quickly and, and you can start to realise that operational benefit in a very, very short time frame, e even on some journeys which might have been perceived as, as perhaps complex, uh, you know, b uh, b before the start of this, this presentation. So we're going to do some, some key takeaways, and then we're going to do a Q&A. So we're going to open up the, um, the questions tab at the, at the side of your Go to webinar panel, and you'll be able to um, be able to type in um, any any questions you might have after this. But I suppose what I wanted to do was just leave you with these kind of key points as the, as the key takeaways uh, from from today's session, really. So, three days, you know, incredibly fast to deploy. You can get this done. You can get this operationalized in a very very short space of time. Don't believe the hype. Don't believe you know what what other people in the market are saying. This this isn't about having this massive team of large uh, team of specialists internally, you know, to support a, a massive business change um, you know, project. You can start looking at specific journeys and getting these done really really quickly, uh, and then growing the platform out as required. Um, we can leverage pre-existing platforms, you know, knowledge bases, FAQs all as the data sources so we can we can we can we can get up to speed quickly and, and use that existing investment or, or knowledge that you already have as i said the, the security compliant aspects shouldn't be uh, overlooked because the chatbot will always give the response which you have told it to provide so the chatbot always always toes the party line and ensures that you're within the bounds of, of, of security and compliance which is which is set out by your teams there so we've got one single point of, of knowledge really serviceable across all those different channels and interfaces that we, we, we discussed. And the power of NLP, AI, and this intuitive reporting that we've got out of the box as well. And what's more is that as a SaaS product, it's, it's flexible pricing and delivery models are, um, are there as well. And one thing that but IPI and Digital CX are, are, are promoting currently, um, we understand, uh, you know, because we've we've been at the at the coalface in the in the trenches on this, supporting our customers with a whole raft of different technologies. We recognise the value that that chatbot and automation can have. So we're offering any customer 90 days worth of free chatbot sessions, so three months worth, uh, to help you know get get you guys through this, uh, get you through this uh, this 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 current. Uh, challenge that we're that we're seeing with uh with, with covid so um you know we will be putting up uh contact details at, at the end of this but um you know if that's something that is of, of interest to you you know if you're seeing seeing challenges or not even if you're seeing challenges but you're looking to to improve the way that you're you're helping customers service their inquiries then and please do feel free to, to to contact us to take advantage of that offer so um so with that we'll open it up to to q a um and so please please do use the uh, the the uh, the questions tab um in your go to webinar uh, um panel and uh, and we'll start to to see there so we've already got actually some that have uh, <clears throat> that have come through so um so yeah just going through some of these uh let's have a look what is the resource impact of in my organization for deploying a chatbot so i suppose rich and simon i don't know if you want to want to pick that one up uh, so, uh, I mean, yeah go on you go first you go right. Time. No, you're right. you go all right, right. Uh, yeah. so what i would say to that is it, it depends how many departments you're going to be firstly you need a subject matter expert you need someone who's going to oversee everything um from uh you know what the conversational journeys that are going to be included 
Uh, you need someone who understands those journeys. Uh, you need someone who's going to uh, keep a track on what those journeys are. Because you go through the process of, um, normally it's, well, uh, one batch or two batches where you're, you're working out what the, um, you know, the, the right journeys to use are. You know, but the, I suppose the, the point is that we want to get this up and running quickly. So one subject matter expert, one of our team would, would liaise directly with them um, and we, you know, we would get four or five um, customer journeys up and running very quickly. Yeah, exactly. Right. I think the, um, the platform makes this very simple, very straightforward. It's intuitive in, in its design and it guides you to um, optimise what, you, what you've already built. Um, but but it needs to form part of a um, you know a structured you know approach from 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 a client's perspective in terms of you know what are the what what's the information you want to share we we don't know that bit we learn it and the, and the system kind of continues to grow and evolve but you know it needs that help and we see programs that have or projects that have that sort of ownership internally um, are the ones that continue to to succeed and it becomes you know, very much part of a continuous improvement program, which uh, as, as it should with any other channel that you're operating within a contact center environment. Okay, so um, uh, we've had another one. What other, what results do organizations see? Any concrete figures perhaps to share insurance stroke financial services would be of particular interest? Yeah, so we see, um, we see some really quite interesting results. So we look at this from in terms of things like, um, uh, successful outcomes so how many kind of contacts have actually been handled so we um, we, we actually all, you know see very quickly within often for some customers within a matter of weeks they're getting up to sort of 25 30 percent um, improvements in self-service through um, you know being able to move some of this away from the front line and that's you know and then it grows and evolves and you're getting upwards of 40 50 percent recognition is always important so how many of the questions that customers are asking you know are the, is the chatbot able to understand you know we regularly see high 90 percent of, of um, being able to answer the questions that customers have got and complete the task which is really important um, actually we get some really good MPS CSAT type um, results as well because obviously at the end of the chatbot you want to be collecting um, you know data around you know did we manage to handle your uh, question today or you know customer feedback uh, metrics or whatever and we um, and, and we get some very high points uplift in, in MPS as well um, you know so and it, and it varies by by industry the, the main thing to clear it almost touches on the resource bit is you know it's very much down to um, how you design the chatbot as part of your kind of customer journey um, how you consider the way in which you're going to um, position it on the site where it kind of forms part of that that channel um, if you have it on the front page like ASR then you're going to get really high results if you hide it away is three clicks below a contact us then you're going to get lower results right so it's having the confidence quite rightly to put it in the right place in the journey will give you higher results yeah yeah absolutely so um, another one which is uh, what do you see the residual headcount requirement for an effective ongoing program of tuning is needed for a suite of say three to five chatbots so, so typically, um, we see customers um, putting one uh, FTE on this, um, and um, and with the view of really just to, sort of checking and tuning and optimizing. Um, so, you know, the, it, it's as little as that. We've we've replaced some um, alternative technologies. Some of the sort of um, well, it doesn't matter what they were actually, but you know, typically you'd, you'd have sort of five or six people working in a in knowledge management team in order to manage you know other solutions. For us, you know, that often comes down to to, to one FTE. Um, it's entire. It, it, it's um, it's designed for the front line, right? It doesn't require developer skills to be able to make changes to um, to the chatbot sort of conversation. So, um, you know, typically we see somebody in a knowledge management role, a content sort of type role, um, front line team leader. Con you know, even even some companies are putting. Um, um, you know, customer service assistants, you know, on this and you know, including that as part of their role as well. So, um, yeah, look, very, very low effort, low touch in that respect, because you know the, that's the whole point of the the, the platform really is to to yeah. guide and make it really easy for you. Yeah, just just for clarity as well, we've had a, another quick clarification come in. So, so we're not saying one FTE per chatbot to to manage no. this. We're saying no. an FTE to manage the the the, the chatbot workforce, if if you like. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. I just, just, just had a clarification for one of the uh, 
one of the users. I think you guys have been doing some great work is with the sort of integration. So when you are starting to push into other technologies, so when you are coming out of a chatbot into a, a into live chat, when you're coming out of IVR voice bots into um, chatbot, when you're starting to think about that sequence of flow into the WFO product sets and, and everything else, that's that's the bit where you guide and deliver brilliantly, but that the burden of looking after the chatbot itself is often done by the client because um, that's the bit you know which is made easy for them. Yeah, and that's a great segue actually into a, into another question, uh, which was: Is it reliant on existing internal system integration capability? Um, so Rich might want to want to have a pick that one up. Uh, internal system integration so is, 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 is the deployment reliant on existing internal system integration capability no, no is the answer um only when you get in, into more kind of complicated conversational dialogues um would you consider integrating with um you know with a crm system at the beginning it's generally uh, you know questions and answers and, and dialogues I mean, you can still have transactional or conversational dialogues, but it's only when you're getting into the really high level actions that, that any kind of level of if integrations really required. Yeah, I think to answer, to answer the COVID questions, you know, you don't, you wouldn't need that right now, right? Um, necessarily, it's when you want to get into personalization, it's when you want to go through IDMV, it's when you want to sort of actually start doing some of the transactions. Um, you know, that that becomes really important to be able to, as we do, connect into. You know, the sales forces and the Microsoft Dynamics and all the others, you know, that so we, we make that integration through API links really, really straightforward. So because that means we can push and pull data, uh, we can personalize the, the dialogues, we can um, make it much more of a depth uh, conversation than just a standard sort of FAQ type, type approach where it's generic by its nature. Um, so those that are successful are absolutely personalizing. Yeah, I mean, is that good stuff? Classic example, the NI Water example that Simon gave before. Yeah. Um, the majority of that is just um, questions and answers and dialogues. There's uh, and now we're moving towards a lot more of the integration work with them. Um, but yeah, a large proportion of it is just your very standard question and answer and dialogue stuff. But for that, it's very. Hard. Hard. I'm just Perfect conscious of time, that. guys. We're, um, we're 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 we've run over a little bit, which is which is which is a I guess a good good thing with all the questions we've had through. So just a couple of final questions, and we'll any any questions we haven't we're not able to answer, we'll pick up separately and and uh, and share one to one answers and uh, with with those those individuals after the event. But we've had one that was uh, we've mentioned moving customers out of the IVR queues. How does that work? Um, well, quite simply, we have an application which will be monitoring those inbound call queues, and when we if we identify uh, an 07 number uh, in the UK, for example, which is the the, the universal sort of uh, code for for, for mobile phones uh, in the UK, we can offer the customer the option of accepting a, an outbound SMS uh, to that number that they're presenting. So if the customer accepts that, we'll then initiate the SMS. Uh, the content of that SMS is completely customizable um, from the web portal so that uh, you can you can have the exact messaging you want to in there um, including obviously the option of, of initiating a chat session with uh, with digital cx so that's sort of very high level in a nutshell how that works and of course the final question which it wouldn't be a, uh, it wouldn't be a, a, a tech webinar without that which is how much does it cost um, of course so um, so the, the short answer is it's a SaaS based uh, solution and it's charged on the number of sessions you do. So effectively the number of interactions which, which happen. Um, and suffice to say, you know, you, you're talking pennies, um, pennies per, per session. So uh, it's an extremely cost effective way of handling those interactions. When you think about the average price uh, or handling uh, charge of a, of a human led interaction in the, in the UK contact centers, which can go anywhere from sort of two pounds up to sort of over five pounds per transaction in uh, in some of the more sort of uh, high value, uh, high value places. So, um, guys, with, with that as I said, apologies. We have had a, a few more questions, but we'll we'll get 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 individual responses. I'm just very conscious that we're we're now 15 minutes over, but I'd like to thank you all very much for for attending. I hope you found today useful. Simon, Rich, thank you very much again for attending and your input. Um, thank you. And uh, yeah. Please, everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you on our next webinar very soon.
All the best. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you.